Hi, everyone. Welcome to wellnessresourcesupport.com. On this episode of an Ask an Expert, we are here with speaker, author, and registered nurse Judith Sands. Judith is the author of Home Hospice Navigation, The Caregiver's Guide. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today, Judith. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to share with your audience. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about your, your background and um, your inspiration for writing this book. I am a nurse with extensive experience in risk, patient safety, and over the years I have directed a number of hospital discharge planning programs, case management, and have often been involved with those difficult end of life discussions with families. I'm a, an advocate and truly believe that individual wishes need to be honored. Okay. There are often misconceptions between palliative care and hospice care. Can you tell us a little bit about each and, and what the difference is? The main difference between palliative and hospice care is that under hospice, the family and the individual, of course, the loved one, has made the decision and executed their advance directive that they do not want life prolonging uh, procedures, whether that's nutrition and hydration, CPR, ventilator. Uh, but both in palliative care and hospice care, the focus is on comfort measures. And uh, every effort is made by clinicians to identify the source of pain or symptoms that need to be controlled. Okay. Thank you for that. And how important is it? Because People hear this as they're going through life and it's important for advanced care planning and directives and these are conversations you wanna have when, before someone is ill. Uh, how important is that from the medical aspect of, of things? Advanced care planning really needs to begin when someone is 18 years and over because prior to that, the parents or guardians make that decision. And it's so unfortunate that the whole issue in area of identifying preferences and wishes doesn't happen in most circumstances. So if a young teenager or college student is in a very tragic car accident or any other sports accident, and the family does not know what that individual's wishes are, how can they abide by them? Having to make those decisions in a crisis, such as after a tragic accident, or after uh, being advised of a terrible diagnosis, whether it's cancer or end stage fill in the blank, that isn't the time when people are thinking at their best and are most able to articulate the wishes. So from my perspective, whatever you can do to identify wishes before a crisis, uh, because crisis management is never the best way to go. I, I agree wholeheartedly and I, tell people all the time, you're never too young to have things on paper, never too young to have a healthcare proxy or any, any sort of medical directive. Uh, in the book, you reference four levels of hospice care. Can you describe the, the four levels and, and what they are? Sure. Hospice at home. Most Americans want to die at home, yet 70% of them don't have that opportunity. There's also the opportunity for intensive symptom management or crisis uh, care management within a hospice unit. So someone may come from home, 
have their symptoms better controlled, medication management, and then be sent back home. Then there's also those individuals who spend their last days within an inpatient hospice unit. Uh, that may be in a freestanding hospice, or it may be a contracted bed in a hospital. Uh, so they may be in the four walls of a hospital, but they're being cared for under a hospice program. And then there's the respite. Um, the family may need to go out of town or the caregivers need a break from the intensive uh, care management activities. So there is uh, an opportunity to have the loved one spend uh, a few days within a hospice unit so that the family can recharge, re-energize, address whatever may be going on so that the loved one can come back home and they can continue the care management. Okay. And what are some key questions to ask when you're setting up hospice care? One of the most important things is for families to talk to friends, colleagues, and determine and listen to other folks' experiences with the various, various hospices in their particular area. In large metropolitan areas, the family may have the choice of more than one hospice. In a rural area, they may not have that option. And I think the best question to start with is what am I or my loved one going to get from your particular hospice. Not all hospices are created equal. They all share the basic mandated um, uh, aspects of you know, pain management, nutrition, and uh, provision of certain supplies. But the individual needs to ask, what does it mean to me? What does my plan of care look like? Uh, some hospices may appro uh, approach symptom management just that little bit differently than others. Now, this is a bigger issue for folks that are on the healthier side of the hospice continuum. Uh, they may have the opportunity to spend you know, up to that six months time. Uh, the questions are a little bit different if the person is at the real end of life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there, we're in that 24, 48 hours. There's probably not a significant difference uh, between uh, the various hospices. But some hospices have music programs, uh, pet therapy, and to some families and loved ones, that may make a difference. Or is their particular physician or practitioner part of the hospice program and willing to work with the hospice? Not every primary care physician is willing or able to do so. So those are some of the factors. Uh, and for others, they want to know that, loved ones want to know that there is an inpatient unit. Is there the potential or the possibility that towards the end uh, that they could take advantage of that? Some of those decisions are based on how many other patients are in the pipeline to get uh, the access to an inpatient bed. But those are some of the things to start with. But I, there's so much value in having individuals talk to others who have been in a similar situation and acknowledging that there are no two identical situations. Right. Other than the, the physician, the treating physician, are there any other key players that play an important role with the hospice care? Oh, absolutely. 
the circle of care, depending on what the loved one's status is, they may want may have the opportunity to take advantage of social work interventions, nursing, dietary, sometimes even wound care, chaplaincy. And it's again important to be sure who are the players within the hospice organization that the loved one would and the family have access to. Okay. And how can being prepared affect things, uh, like planning in advance, affect things, for example, when you have someone that has no show of an aid that or um, a caretaker that caregiver that that's a no show being prepared in advance. Backup plans are vital. And it begins with your own circle of care. Whoever are the individuals within the family. Um, uh, what do you call, um, or a surrogate family member. But yes, what happens if those people providing the direct care are sick or don't show up? Hopefully individuals and families have what I call the backup tree or a call tree, a list of agencies that they have spoken to or contracted with in anticipation or in preparation for someone that couldn't show or the loved one's status changes and the individual is no longer able to participate and move as they could previously. So now it may take two people to roll them in bed to do a uh, bed change, or it takes two people to get the individual up to the commode. Mm. And it's so important um, as one progresses through the home care, home care and home care hospice to continuously assess and determine what are the needs and who can help. Because there is nothing worse than getting a call, either from the loved one, uh, calling a family member saying, it's 7 a.m. and the caregiver didn't show up and I have to go to work and who's going to be here. Yep. It's heartbreaking also for the loved one, especially if they are alert and oriented and understand that the predicament that they are in, and on some level they're going to feel uh, apprehension or mistrust because their routine has been disrupted. Uh, oh boy, now I have to break in another caregiver. Or what happens if? I can't secure a caregiver. Do I have to, does the loved one's family member then have to call in sick to work or do some type of a patchwork effort uh, to get care at the bedside? And whenever you do something last minute, it increases the probability of things not going well. Maybe then there's going to be a medication misadventure or something is going to be done out of the routine that the loved one is used to. Mm -hmm. And that causes anxiety all the way around. Absolutely. Now that also drives home the point that families need to have what I'll call an emergency stock. It's that extra box of wipes or extra box of adult diapers, an extra dose of medication that's put somewhere in a closet that only a few people know so that uh, if there's a problem that supplies don't arrive as planned or there was a larger than usual use of diapers due to, for some reason, that there isn't a crisis. 
I can absolutely relate to that. We had a cabinet that was like pretty much a, a medical supply closet where we yeah. had doubles and triples of everything. And, and if you took the last of something, you had to add it to the list that had to be bought immediately. That There should never be less than one, basically. I, I can absolutely relate to that. Um, it's very important for families and any caregiver to, to be on the same page, specifically when it comes to hospice care, understanding instructions and being able to communicate on a consistent basis and making sure everyone's on the same page. How, how do you feel, how important is it that everyone in the hospice care, or even in general, is on the same page when it comes to the uh, end of life stage? That is so critical. If there is, if the hospice team does not understand the cultural, religious, uh, or quirkiness mm -hmm. of a particular patient, uh, client, then it is very difficult to establish rapport. Because from the family and loved one's side, then it's, they're not listening to me. They don't understand what I want. They're not respecting my wishes. And so often it is an issue of communication. Whether it's a breakdown between individuals or at the onset, there was not the clarity as to uh, what the family wanted. So let's turn it now to the hospice side as they give guidance to the loved one or members of the family or circle of care. It is critical, not just the first individual that they spoke to and gave the instructions, but realizing that when individuals are stressed, mm -hmm. when there is so much going on, as a clinician, I truly believed, I told them everything, and I may have, but the question is, did they hear everything, and did they understand everything? So, of course, to decrease some of that stress, providing written instructions, maybe providing a short video, oh, one or two minute clip on the phone that can be shared among the circle of care members so that everyone is hearing and seeing the same information. And from the family and care, circle of care side, if it doesn't feel right, feeling comfortable saying, I don't understand, or show me again. And from the clinician side is using that ask me three, uh, or actually from the family, you know, why is this important that I do this? What happens if I don't do this? And then again, what are my alternatives? And sometimes there are no alternatives. But if both sides approach with that mentality and that desire to share information in a positive framework, then hopefully there are less um, challenges and the communication is improved. Uh, it's important to write it down, to organize and get into a routine. And sometimes it's just sharing the just-in-time information. Not overwhelming folks at any point. And of course, the backup resources. I have to say that it never even occurred to me to make a video. We had gone through multiple different aids and you know you're going with my mom was in a wheelchair so moving her was a bit of a challenge and given her left side neglect it was it was tough it never occurred to me to make a video that's 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 a great idea 
Um, and everybody's got a smartphone nowadays. You just record and, and something that's very easy to share it. That's, wow, that's it. <laughs> and um, along with that is if certain things need to be in position, especially if someone has had a stroke and has a lack of ability to utilize one side or the other, or they have preferences for how they like their dressing table set up or how they like their meal set up, which, you know, if they have assistive devices, yep. take a picture, print it out, and post it somewhere. Uh, Mom loves things set up this way. Uh, make your life easier. This is how mom is used to having things. Uh, so we can get creative. Yeah, oh, absolutely. During this time when people are mostly stressed and the emotion is very, very high, and as they say, when your emotion is high, your intelligence can be low, what, what advice would you give to caregivers and families of someone in hospice care to, to help manage that, that stress level to be a little bit more on the, on the playing field, understanding what's going on? A caregiver can only be a caregiver after they have taken care of you themselves. So often we reflect back on what we hear on an airplane. Put your oxygen mask on first before assisting uh, someone next to you in need. And if the caregiver hasn't had sleep, hasn't had a good meal, hasn't had a shower, hasn't had a chance to take care of those very basic human needs, they aren't always going to be the best caregiver. Not that they don't have the best intentions, but they are burning the candle. They're stressed out, they're burned out. So some of the things that I suggest to caregivers Hopefully they can find someone who's willing to come in, sit with the loved one for 15, 20 minutes. So at least they can go have a shower without worrying that something's going to happen to their loved one. It's mm -hmm. being able to say, I need to disengage for a few minutes, whether they journal and pour out their feelings, their frustrations, their concerns, their worries on a piece of paper. They don't have to share it with anyone, but there's many individuals report such a therapeutic and stress relieving feeling once they can write it out. Other people find listening to music sitting outside in the sunshine or looking out the window, taking a short walk. It's something that will bring a little bit of joy, a little bit of reinvigoration uh, so that they can go back in and face the challenges of caregiving, which aren't easy. And one of the big problems is as, as a loved one declines, very frequently the caregiving needs go up. And if someone has been a caregiver for several years and they haven't had a chance for a little bit of relief, they're going to begin not only uh, suffering some of the physical but also the emotional. Uh, toll that goes along with it. If they're members of a religious group or community group, often they may have a caregiving circle, someone that can come in and offer them a little bit of support and assistance. But then that's also uh, where hospice is wonderful. Uh, many hospices have volunteers who are willing to come in and support the family. That's great. Thank, thank you for that advice. It is very important. 
for caregivers, like you said, put your oxygen on yourself first before you can help someone else. That's number one in, in safety, I'm sure. So I would like to thank you uh, for joining us today. And I'm just going to hold your book up one more time. If anybody's interested in purchasing this book, the link for the website or reaching out to Judith, you can reach out to her. Her link will be below in the, in the text. Thank you so much for joining us today.